just decide they didn't want to come to our block because we weren't worth the money. My position with them has always been, if you have a monopoly, you have to serve everybody. Their position hasn't been that. It needs to be profitable to serve them. So uh, they wanted thousands uh, from us to connect from either across Hanover Street, across uh, Henrietta, or back from Montgomery Street, and we kept saying no. Um, it was like 7,000, but they promised they would give us subsidy of 1,000, and we said no. Um, so then they called recently and said, at a time when I was saying to them, you know, uh, I think you're, it's because this is the standard now, what we need and we can't get it, I think your failure to serve us when you have the monopoly is actually damaging us, and at some time we have to take that up. I'm not sure that cut any ice, but um, about three months later or something of that nature, they did call and say, we'll hook you up for $99, and it'll be a higher monthly, and we took our pencils and we checked out a 24-month contract and decided we were getting an extreme deal. I think it would be, it's like 1,700 more than we would be paying if we didn't sign the contract. But then we think after that, that the technology will go down in price because by then it will be yesterday's technology, but more than we need. And that's the hope is to place ourselves there. So as of Monday, uh, we're doing that, which means that across, let's say, um, a one and a half to two month period, uh, we could be streaming our service you know, directly. You know, we could simply, people could watch us as we worship and it could be available later than as the sermons are now. Uh, up until uh, through this week, I guess, we had the problem that when, uh, of course, Bob records this and then Cricket was uploading it, when we would go to upload, she would be here in the office, of course, and we have voiceover and internet phone, which is another savings uh, that also allows us uh, greater options. For instance, now you can call our phone, push one to get right to the beep, um, push two for various prayers to pray with us or to make a request, push three and the phone starts ringing and it's Wayne Rogal to tell you he'll ride you on the van to church. And so all these things are, you know, we're trying to be um, as uh, consumer friendly as possible, I guess we'd say. But anyway, um, so when she would upload it, our phone service would go down because we just didn't have enough, you know, broadband with now we do, now we have quite a bit, we can, um, we can have a field day. So that's one thing, we want to speak the language of internet because we can, and also because today when I tell people about the church, one of the things they do is they say, well, I'll check you out on the internet. So we want to have a good presence there. Um, secondly, the, um, and this will also mesh together ultimately with our phone app and uh, you know, with various other things that help us to be who we need to be. And so if you haven't downloaded the phone app, please feel free to do so. Uh, just go to your Play Store, your iTunes. And I say this to this group because you're the most likely to do it. And uh, then there are certain reminders now and then that we can put out. For instance, um, when you were coordinating the, the dinner, we could say, oh, last day to sign up is such and such. We send out one notification that week. We won't abuse it, that's for sure, because I hate it when people abuse it to me on other things. So all those things are, are part of it. The Spanish and the Swahili reference, by the way, is that, of course, we have Spanish-speaking people in our uh, circuit now, and uh, also that, uh, based on a grant from the Lutheran Heritage Foundation, whom we support, by the way, um, uh, Concordia Publishing House is now able to publish the Lutheran Confessions in Swahili, and that will cover a large part of the continent of Africa. Even for some people where it's not their first language, at least it will be in a language they know. And so we're very happy with that because the church is putting roots down in Africa, and it's important for them to have the materials to train um, catechists and teachers and pastors and others, uh, and frankly, just lay people who have a hell on the shoulders more know, know these things, you know. So that's uh, that's all in there. There was there was actual meaning there uh, when I said that I didn't just reach for any old alliteration. Um, other thing is, um, so, some people have asked, and I'll, once again, I'll talk to you. I just don't have a good time to talk to the whole church about this. We. I, um, if there were a congregational meeting, I suppose that would be official, but still not a lot of people to come. The, um, uh, did I talk to you about the fact that when they put my name up for, did I tell you they put me up for district president? I told you that. And I thought the church should know that. Did I tell you, pardon me while I talk here. <coughs> Clear the pipes a little bit. Um, did I tell you also that 
why I let that roll when it could mean it might take me away. Did I talk to you about that? No. Okay, well, well, let me say something about that. First of all, I didn't win. Second of all, the district loves its incumbents, and it was assumed I would not win. Um, now, but here's, here's the deal. The, you get to speak at the convention, and um, there are some friends of mine, some in the Carolinas and some around here that think that would be cool, so they got me to do that. But it's limited time. You don't get to say a lot. Um, but what happens is this. Uh, it's considered a call, and um, as if another church issued a divine call and said, Pastor, would you come and serve us? And then I would have a discerning process as, do I belong here? Do I belong at this, at this other place? Um, well, the same thing is done with the district presidency. And so um, the question would be, well, why would you do that? Why would, if you could stop that from happening, why wouldn't you stop that from happening? And that's a fair question. And it's why, because some people have, have asked in that regard, that I do want to say something about that. Um, in the uh, first church where I served, I received an average of a divine call every year. And that was very hard on the church, actually. But um, uh, in, in every case, when it came, I kept thinking, no, I don't, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. Came to a point where I thought I was sort of done writing one chapter there. And in the discernment of another call to firm, I thought I should write another chapter at the same place. And on we went. Uh, the church was a small church. It was about 13 years old when I got there. I was probably pastor number six. At that point, they had been through a lot. And, uh, and I, I then ended up being the longest staying because I was just shy of seven years, six and two thirds years, something like that, uh, when I did take a call. And uh, the call I took was to a um, assistant pastorship in North Carolina. And uh, mind you, some things don't change. Um, one of the members walked up to me when I announced the call, once one more announcement of the call for them, shook my hand and said, well, this is when we know you're not going to take it. And I said, well, why is his name was Art? Why is that Art? He said, it's for an assistant pastor, and you have too big an ego to say yes to that. <laughs> He's probably right about the size of the ego, but in the end, that had great possibility, and I did accept that call. The church, by the same time, had gotten off of subsidy um, it was a subsidized mission church for its whole life. And, and I said to them, it's immoral that we should be taking district money this long. A number of people all agreed they would put up $1,000 and reduce the mortgage to the point. And I, would, I said I would take a cut, reduce the mortgage to the point that the debt service then would, be, would help put us ahead, the loss of debt service, and we wouldn't have the need for subsidy. And that began, began to happen. Um, that was a few years before that final call, and the elders, the head elders of the church had said, we're going to get him up to scale because we want to do right by him, just like he thinks we should do right by district. So it was a wonderful Christian spirit, I thought, there. And uh, the year they got me up to scale was the year the call came in, and I left. So by all human reasons, it shouldn't have happened, which I think there were divine reasons. So... Um, Fast forward, and I'm in Baltimore City, and I'm 59. And calls generally don't come if you're in your 50s or if you're in urban ministry. They don't come if you're in your if you're in mid to late 50s because they say, "We'll call him, we'll get used to him, and retire." Okay. And then the second thing that happens is district presidents often put their name on a list and suggest to churches, "Well, here's someone who might be good in your situation." And uh, they also put you on when they say, um, uh, he's, he's been where he is too long and probably could use a change. So what happens is the um, urban pastors generally don't get put on those. You know why? Think of how long it takes. Now, Martini, this call was filled in six months after Pastor Biggs retired. It was accepted in six months. Um, but most of the churches around the city were an average of three years, our savior was four years vacant. That's terrible in a city church. District presidents know that. So as long as the person at the church isn't outright ruining the place, they just let it roll. Okay. So I said to myself, so how do I discern then that, I'm, that I should be here, that I should continue, that I haven't been too long, that there is God in this? And I sense God in this all the time. But still, when it came to people who I did not have any asking in this, but who decided we're going to nominate. 
Um, then the question was, do I let it roll? Do I let the process work? And my view was, this was so unlikely because incumbents in district win that I would let it roll and say, Lord, this is truly yours. And it is, look, um, first of all, I love you all, and it's not for me to want to go. Second of all, you have to consider that um, we have a new member class of eight people. You know, why do I want to suddenly just walk off on them? You know. So it was truly a spiritual quest of saying, Lord, we always have to put ourselves, I hope you do this, always have to put ourselves in your hands, even when we think we know what we want and what should be. And so that was the reason why I did that role and said, Lord, it's up to you. And um, so at the end, then, the vote comes in, they elect their incumbent, and off we go, and that is that. So, um, but the question behind that, a couple of people have asked, well, does that mean you would have had to leave? And the answer was, that is true, but it is also true that it was so unlikely that it's important to make sure that I'm not the one making this happen, but that God is, and I think it was a good opportunity to do that, not without risk, but I just as soon risk on the Lord, you know. So that is, that is do, you, do you have any question or thought or question of how the process works or question of how the process worked for me or anything else? Because I'm happy to talk to you about it because you are, as I say, the cream of the crop. You come the extra hour. Yes. Now that your name has been out there, yes. Uh, probably not. <laughs> um, I, well, here's the, that's an excellent question, and, and those things are possible to a point. Um, because there are some who feel that the district is um, to the left of center in Missouri in its present configuration of leadership, um, there will always be those who want us to either be more centrist or more to the right. And uh, here at Martini, I think that we look like the mainstream of Missouri St. Lutheran is, in the country, we probably look like maybe the center to center right in the district. Um, but we look like Martini. I mean, you know, we, I don't think anyone senses this spectrum while we're doing our worship or while we're teaching or anything else, except I might float that out. Um, and I don't really care. <laughs> you know, I care about this. I really don't care where that means we fall, you see. So, Putting me in front of the district, um, they also put me in for vice president, okay? And um, I had been secretary at one time. Vice president doesn't take you away from your church. And uh, Reverend Lloyd Gaines, who had been the um, executive for a Black Urban and Multicultural Ministry for years, and is pastor at Peace Lutheran, uh, which is primarily African American church in DC, um, did receive the, the votes for the vice presidency. That I'd have been happy to come home with, but there is a relief not to worry about. Um, but leaving the congregation is not my desire, and that position would, would be a headache. I think the older that I get, the less I even think I should let my name stand for the sake of doing the position well if they did. Um, so it is possible three years from now, I won't really feel like I'll would take that because you travel everywhere uh, throughout the district and you're dealing with, oh, this pastor and this church are having a squabble. You know, this church is having, um, is ready to go down the tubes. It's, it's sort of like Baltimore times, steroids, you know. And so it is possible that people would think one more time, let's try this. I'm not sure that I would be able to just say, let's let it roll again. Uh, based on how I might feel. I, I do know, I certainly don't have the energy I had when I was 37 and came here, you know. So, um, and I find that with the youth, I have to work harder to relate, you know. And so I, I do wonder at what time, you know, is it best that there is someone with more energy? But I, I, back to that ego remark, I look at seminarians coming out and I think, I don't think they have anything on me. I think some can do something better than me, but I think I've got some things too. And so I'm not saying that my being here is bad for the congregation, you see. And so it's all those things you do really to your heart think about and want to have go right. But I will tell you this, after twice, then they'll say, well, he's, he can't win. And they'll look for somebody else, which is what politicians do. If you remember district, um, when I became secretary, all these people in district began talking to me and saying, how wonderful it is, you know, you really in the pastoral work. And I said, no, I haven't. My call is my highest work. 
And this is something else the congregation is willing I can do. But the pastoral office, and, and please hear this, the pastoral office is God invented. All of the district is man invented, including its offices. It is a convention of churches, so to speak, where we say, hey, we need to do this, and it takes numbers to do this. It, a district is really simply the way chooses to, to divide itself. It could go on convention and redivide itself at any time, although the reality is it probably would go through a great study. But the point is, we get together and we say, well, what can't we do well as an individual church? Oh, I know. We can't run a seminary for pastors. So let's all band together churches of like theology and teach that theology to people who are candidates for the ministry. Um, what else can't we do? Well, we're not good at running our own publishing house. So let us get together and print materials that will be good for our churches. And by the way, it seems the Vacation Bible School materials are um, uh, Splash Canyon are really being widely accepted. Sometimes people go off with other publishers within our synod. But I'm looking down the Baltimore Bulletin and so then all these churches of ours are doing the CPH one this year. It's kind of fun. Um, so we have a publishing house. Well, then the other thing is you want to send a missionary to another country. That country does not want to deal with the local church. That country wants to deal with a recognized entity. We are, depending how you count it, the ninth or tenth largest Protestant Christian group in the United States as the Missouri, not just Lutherans, as the Missouri Synod. And so what happens is deal with the Synod and allow for the appropriate visas and passports or the appropriate denials. We, some of you remember Reverend Tom Christ, and we tried real hard to get him into Singapore. And in the end, after supporting him in that process for about a two-year period, he came here and preached and everything. And um, the and Muslim influence, uh, which the, there is, I guess I would say nominally Muslim, but Singapore loves to be urbane. And um, the Muslim influence became strong enough that Singapore blinked and said, we're not going to make you guys, they were going to establish a, um, an a agency a beachhead uh, there and go out to other countries. And they said, our climate's not right that we can do that. And that's why he was refused. He's in Texas now being a pastor. Speaking of the call of God and how that might work, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. There are countries that don't allow us in. I could not name you. Uh, well, Sudan is one. Um, but there, there are others, too. And North Korea would be one. Uh, Venezuela would not allow us. Now, there are a couple of rump mission societies that would not be different from like the Winnicott Project in Baltimore, except these guys are saying, we're going to ask people from anywhere in the Synod and try and send people into those countries. But these, sometimes these are the people that end up um, in a prisoner release program <laughs> through the president. Um, but other times they get to do it or they just get summarily kicked out. But the if a leader is closing his country to the gospel, then shouldn't we try to get in anyway? Jesus did say all nations, and that answer would be, yeah, we probably could. So there are those churches who say, okay, they, they, they get some correspondence, and we'll, we'll do that. I look and say at the present time, um, I assume there's some radio transmission, other ways of getting in. Some places we can get in and teach English, for instance, because it is the world's uh, language yet, and... Uh, and then you can give a private witness, but you can't do it as part of the group. So, there, but there are churches who specifically pick a group like that that may may or may not be an RSO or synod because they want a certain arm's length so synod doesn't get implicated if something goes wrong internationally, and uh, and send them. Yeah, but we we've said uh, just and then I'll, I'll take your part. But we've said there's so much need anyway. We're just going to go through synod and send somebody that way. Mm -hmm. We've reached all nations. We've already reached all nations, but we have to reach all language groups. The scripture says we have to. Um, the, the question of um, not so much the Great Commission of reaching all nations, but this uh, uh, this gospel will be preached you know, to all the earth, and the question is, what does that mean? So, but there you are. Okay. Well, thank you all. Any other question, though? Did I answer your question at all? Okay, okay. But I just want you to know where, where my heart is and where I saw I made a risk, too, because I didn't think it was good for me and the ministry as far as, like I say, our new member class coming. But that's not the only thing. Just various things we have to deal with here 
as, as it's no secret, and I hate to have the words come from my lips, if I, I'll say the good part. If I'd been here 13 years and said, see you all later, I would have been a pastor over a growing congregation, and then that would be that. But then all at once, all congregations began diving when it came to the way America goes to church or doesn't go to church. And so I've ridden with you back through some some the gains we've made. But at the same time, we in our circuit went from being the fourth largest Missouri Synod church in our circuit to being like back and forth between the first and second largest. Because while we have taken a slide, the others have, have had disastrous uh, issues. And so, and they haven't been fights and they haven't been all that, it's just been attendance. And uh, so um, you sort of feel a need to stick around and see that out. You know, if you're in a relationship, you're in a relationship for the hard times as well as the good times, you know. But then that whole question of call of God is where I said, well, I have to let God be God. So we've done all that, and he's kind of affirmed, you know, what, what I'm happy with. I also didn't want to sell my house or something. I don't know. So, but that's, that's stuff you can't worry about. It'll be, it'll be gone one day when I'm gone, so it doesn't matter. You know, so anything else before we jump in? So, well, thank you for that. Thank you for that. I, um, I think you, you deserve as much of an explanation as I can give. I stand up here, and I say, I think we have the kind of relationship where I need to announce this, but I also... You know, look, I could have played the odds, said nothing about it, and just let me, let me lose, and uh, and that would be that. And, uh, of course, there's always a question, well, if I won, I could look bad for not having told you, but that's really not the deal. The deal is that the relationship demands that you would know that and that you should know it, you see, even if it wasn't going to go anywhere. So, so yes. Now, here's a little something. Um, with Vice President, um, it was like a 16 vote different, okay? And so what happens is I got a call from the president. Of course, I went over and congratulated him, told him we know each other. This is, this is not like national politics, okay? It's just they have to choose somebody. So I went over and congratulate. We talked for a bit. So last week he gives me a phone call and says, so what does Baltimore need? <laughs> and, uh, and so I think if anything, it does put us just a little more on the map. I think there was a past... A past president who, if I say that, then we don't say which one, uh, who kind of wrote Baltimore off and um, just said, ah, there's nothing can be done there. And uh, we're glad that God the Holy Spirit turned around and brought us 50 librarians over here. And I got a call from Pastor Art Boone Sunday. Had to be last, yeah, we had the baptism last Sunday. So it was last Sunday because I was on the way to be with the family for about an hour. And so he says, do you want to go out to lunch? And, and Art Boone, Pastor at Nazareth, uh, Spanish speaking. Um, Want to go to lunch? And I said, oh, I'd love to go to lunch, but I also love to go where I'm going. And I told him, you know, what was up. And uh, he said, Oh, okay. Well, he said, I just wanted to tell you, um, we had 35 people in church. And he's only been doing this 20 months, okay, which is astonishing. Now, it's a peak Sunday. That's why I called. But you have your ups and downs, but that was cool to hear. And I said, Well, how many of those are Anglos? Because it was roughly eight faithful. I say Anglos, but three of them were from a combo, but not Hispanics. And uh, so what happens is um, he said, oh, none of them. Oh, we had 15 in that service. We have two services, one church, but two services. And so altogether they have 50 people. Okay, well, I guess we all have to look over our shoulder and watch our backs. Thank you, Lord. But that's um, the greatest growth in our congregations is coming in people who are coming from overseas and have... As the um, as Augustine says over at Redeemer, they haven't been in America too long, because when they are, then they then they just don't ever. If they aren't coming in and get into a church fellowship, they find all the dissipation that our culture offers. So, all right, well, folks, we uh, I I would turn you to Luke, and I would turn you to Luke because Jesus is on the way into Jerusalem, and I think what we will do is uh, we will look at, in Luke at the final. Uh, parts of the Korean ministry and on his way to Judea. And uh, I do need to say there were some tribes that were settled on the east side of the Jordan back in the day as well. So when I make a big deal, there are Jews and Gentiles. That is true. But some of this is Jewish homeland as well that he was going through uh, in Korea. But the region of the Decapolis and some of this other were mostly um, far less Jewish areas than when he's on the west side of the Jordan. Um, and Luke... Uh, 17, uh, Jesus talks about the, um, 
the coming of the kingdom, he starts talking about these end time sort of things. And uh, am I am I up and on and being but okay? He talks about these end time sort of things. So in the coming of the kingdom, he says, uh, first of all, verse 20, the kingdom of God isn't coming in ways that can be observed, nor they can say, oh, look, here it is. Or there, be, he says, for behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. And this uh, whole thing is a very difficult thing to translate. We can't get back to the Aramaic. The Greek is not uh, in, in this rare instance as clear as we would like. There are some who have said, the king, you know, the king of God is within you, um, among you, um, near you, that sort of thing. And so what happens is, when he says that, there's been a whole lot of teaching back in the 60s when, and of course still fashionable today in some circles, when everyone was looking out, looking over Buddhism, saying, oh, it's within me, and they'd run for this whole you know, God within sort of thing and, and uh, shutting out everything else to have this, this experience with God. Um, um, almost a complete nothingness almost. Um, over, I was in um, Gilman School at the time, and uh, we had chapel every week, and they would rotate of a um, Protestant, a Roman Catholic, and a Jewish rabbi. It almost sounds like they should be walking into a bar, but they were walking into the assembly hall. And uh, so, but, but the priest was, you know, always coming over to him about, and I found God within me, and, and it was all the rage. And apparently it hit St. Mary's Seminary pretty big to, to be talking like that. So the idea of the kingdom of God being among you, within you, in the midst of you, in the midst is the probably the closest translation to the ambiguity of the Greek. So some say, well, it's, it, it means within you, but it's difficult to identify the kingdom of God within you, what that must mean. But then he says it can't be observed, so then that seems to in a very ne negative reasoning way, uh, add veracity to that. But then there are others who say, well, it's when everyone gathers together, it's the group that makes the kingdom of God, and then the kingdom is in its midst. And we would look at church and say, well, maybe that's what he's talking about. There was no church then, but there was the message going forth, and there were disciples and believers. Uh, I tend to be one that says Jesus is referring to himself. He's referring to himself, and that the point is, People are looking and they can't just always identify it. Some believe, but then all these other people around will perceive you're a prophet. Or the Pharisees and Sadducees and scribes and all who thought he was the enemy. And so the kingdom of God is not always as observable. Jesus needed to be apprehended by faith if he was to be understood. Otherwise, people set themselves as just, oh, he's another prophet or he's, uh, he's not good for us. And so I've always felt that when he stood there, he was saying that, but... Um, is it him? Is it the message? In some ways, some of those things are woven all of the same cloth, too. So um, it, it is something that is talked about often. But he says to the disciples, days are coming. You'll desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. And they said, you look there, look here. He said, don't go follow them. It's like lightning flashing from one side to the other that you'll see me. It's the way, the way the Son of Man is in his day. So there will be these sort of bursts of seeing here is the kingdom of God. Well, I suppose under persecution that would be true, that you'll, you'll see it, but then it also has to be kept secretive. Uh, it could be that that's what's being talked about going up to 70 AD. It could be that that's what's being talked about in the church's life uh, up to um, toleration in 311 and uh, establishment of Christianity in 313 under Constantine. Um, it could be that that's what the church was after um, adding so much weight of various human philosophies and traditions that it needed to burst out again at the Reformation as simply scripture alone and faith alone, you know, grace alone. Um, so all these times are when the kingdom is both hidden and then revealed, and it happens you know, throughout. Uh, will it be that way on the last day? Probably so. And that's what makes the last day even harder to deal with, is that there's all the motif of things happening over and over and over and over. And then one day it's going to be really it. Because if you think of it this way, the world will always deal with Jesus in the same um, moral way. Uh, if it kills him the first time, and we are all part of that problem, the blessing is that he is then our solution, and we are aware of that. But as the world generally wants to categorize or put him in a more harmless place, a less controversial place, um, the more then that he will burst forward again, much like the lightning flashes from one end to the other. But the other thing about one side to the other deals with when Jesus says in Matthew um, that all the world will see him when he comes again. 
And so when he talks about the lightning, uh, I've been at times I'll drive to someone's house and say, oh, you know, there was this lightning. It went from over there to over there. And they go, well, I saw that lightning too. And so any of us who have had that sort of experience, you know, understand that it's part of that idea maybe that all the world will see him on the last day. But again, these are things which, like the book of Revelation, end up being uh, filled with questions until they happen, at which time then we will see that every T has been crossed and every I dotted in these prophecies. Okay? So the prophecy by nature is unclear. It's tantalizing. It helps you think a certain way, but it is otherwise unclear. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. And you're sort of asking after that, maybe? Or? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, physics would be a lot easier if it were, I'll tell you. You know, yeah. Um, the. Uh, when, when TV was invented, everyone said, well, phew, now that's solved because the whole world will all have TV sets and he'll be on TV and that's how the whole world will see him. Um, then there are those who look and see because we're told that the, the, um, the planets will be shaken, the stars will fall from the sky, and we're seeing an end to the creation. And the question is, you know, Jesus can do what he wants with physics. Does he with light and with time allow that even though it's around the world, all the world can see him, you see? And so that is, that is, from an Einstein point of view, absolutely possible. So I guess one could also say, well, would it be like an adaptation, a poor adaptation, but an adaptation of Pentecost where um, all will see him, but it's just it would be a, a trick of the eyes that God would perform. I have problems with that one. He's Lord over creation. I'd rather see him, you know, bending the, the light waves in, in some way, but yeah, yeah. Um, so that's an opinion of mine, of course. I can't label it anything else. You flat earther. Yeah. <laughs> it, no, but you're right. You're right. It is, it's a problematic question, you know. But I, think, I do think that little break into uh, present physics has helped us to, to go one step closer to understanding it a little better. But, you know. But if we didn't understand, if we were all flat earthers, we would still say he said it, and so we're going with it. You know what I mean? It's um, he's lured over these things. So, but sometimes it's fun to see an opening where we say, "Oh, well, that that goes with this. We just haven't carried it out far enough." Um, oh, but he, being the son of man, must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. So, just as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. They're eating, drinking, marrying, being given in marriage until the day Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, just as it was in the days of Lot, they were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But on the day when Lot went out from Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven, destroyed them all. So it will be on the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Right now he's saying he's not revealed as such. Um, but there will be this glorious day when he is. And so uh, we look then for things to be unexpected by most of humankind, right? Okay, um, on that day, let he who is on the housetop with his goods in his house not come down to take them away. Likewise, let one who is in the field not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Uh, whoever seeks to preserve his life will lose it, but whoever loves his life will keep it. Now, it's of interest that, that is said here because many people simply take that by itself and talk about loving your life and losing it or keeping it. Uh, in this case, it is in the context of dire emergency when people are fleeing. And the question comes, and remember, it all, we've been through enough Old Testament prophecy books. The question comes, okay, is this one of these things where we're moving around in places in time? Remember how we have Joel who says, uh, you know, Peter gets up at Pentecost and quotes Joel. This is what the prophet Joel spoke about when he said, in that day I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh, and you know, your, your sons and your daughters will prophesy, and your old men will dream dreams, young men see visions, and all these sorts of things. And then he cuts off the next verse, which says, you know, and the, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will turn to blood, and the stars will fall on that terrible day of the Lord. And you think, how can he quote this and say it's Pentecost, and even the day after Pentecost, none of that other stuff has happened. 
But that's how prophecy goes. We've talked about how there are these time gaps where it really is true the day a day in the Lord's economy you know, is a thousand years or a thousand years a day. And so we get these things stacked up on each other. They do not follow the solar calendar. They don't follow the lunar calendar. They follow the prophetic calendar. Okay, and so here it really appears that he's talking about 70 AD when Rome comes and rains terror upon the city. And uh, we've talked about the prophecy fulfilled as Rome for a day, almost unquestioning, uh, unexpectedly, pauses the battle and then goes back into it the next day during 70 AD. During that time, everyone who knew not to go back for anything had the breathing room to be able to escape because there's no one to interdict them for like half a day. And then it all went back again, they destroyed the whole city, they crucify all the men, they you know, they level the temple so not one stone is upon the other, and it's that way to this day. And so we look at that and we say, you know, it appears that. Well, one of the things Jesus does by giving this is, he appears to be talking about the very end, and so we'll remember that. But the other thing is that we appreciate that they thought this way. Remember I said prophecy teaches you how to think? You, may, you won't know everything until the, um, the, the prophecy happens and then the T's are all crossed and the I's are dotted and God's word is fully true. Um, but what happens is, in this case, um, in 70 AD they thought of these words, so they ran. Now maybe these words are still speaking of the end. But it worked for them, and, and there's a method of thinking that Jesus wants you to be in. So was the Old Testament, the method of thinking of the Messiah. No T's crossed and dies out until he came, eyes got until he came, basically. But once they were, all this sort of fit into place, how this could all be, you see. So it'll be with the second coming. It's prophesied, it's hard to figure out. What happens, it'll all fit beautifully to the things we're told. And so, uh, and this saved people's lives, saved the, the, probably the life of the Christian church, the fledgling church, back in 70 AD. Anyway, um, I tell you, in, uh, in that night, two will be in one bed, one's taken, the other's left. Two women grinding together, one taken, the other left. And they said to him, where, Lord? And instead of saying, oh, it'll be over at so-and-so, at such and such a time, RSVP if you're coming, he says, where the corpse is, there the vultures will gather, and does to us what he means to do by keeping us sort of ever questioning, ever looking, ever wondering, so that his return will always stay on our minds, and that we will always look to be faithful, even in the suddenness of it. Some, sometimes a, a good Christian person has said to me, Pastor, I was actually going to do such and such and such and such, which we would both agree you know, was wrong, and they said, and then I thought, is that where I'd want to be if the Lord were to, you know, blow the trumpet and the angel would have shout right then? And so I didn't do it, you know. I said, well, good. You know, the Lord taught you how to see the world and to think in such a way that it would keep you from evil. So, you know, it's those sorts of things. And, and I know, look, the human nature is such. A certain percentage, possibly, of our listenership could be saying at this time, yeah, but what are the odds? <laughs> That's not how he would have you think. <laughs> But, you know, we know, that, we know that how it goes. He then um, preaches to the people. I want to get up to the triumphal entry. Um, what is that time? Two minutes. Oh, won't get to the triumphal entry. Um, he, he then preaches of a widow who bothers a judge who doesn't care about God or man, just cares about himself. And so finally the reason that he does what he does uh, and helps the widow out is just so she'll stop bothering him. Okay. And so in the doing, he's saying, so if this judge who doesn't care about God or man will finally do something for the one that asks, you keep on bringing your request to God and uh, talk to him about what you need. Uh, if, if a godless, uncaring person will do for someone what they ask, then certainly your heavenly father, who loves you very much, will do what is asked. That's my alarm, isn't it? Um, we will we will stop here and move on from there. I want to get to the triumphal entry next week, and then I want to go a few weeks into the time in Jerusalem during Holy Week, and then I think is when, based on our subjects, um, because we integrate with the Passion, which we were uh, talking in Lent, um, we have finished them. We've made full circle, if you will. Okay, let us pray. 
God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus' ministry, and we thank you for uh, the church which uh, he brought to uh, together at Pentecost through the sending of the Holy Spirit. This Trinity Sunday, we thank you that you have uh, come into our lives and the lives of this world in such a way that we understand your creating and preserving power. We understand your redeeming and saving power. We understand the comfort your Holy Spirit is and his job in bringing us into the faith and preserving us in the faith. So in all these things, dear Lord, bless these words to our hearts. Bless us as we enter your worship, for you alone are worthy, and to you goes all glory. In Jesus' name, amen.